<laughs> didn't realize I was live. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Happy Wednesday. Happy May. Uh, that means we are just 12 short days away from the AP exam, which means emotions are probably high out there. Um, so my goal tonight, first and foremost, besides just reviewing material with you, is to make you feel comfortable and confident that you are going to do an absolutely incredible job on this exam. So what I kind of have on the docket, and this can change and, and should change depending on what you guys want to talk about, uh, is some body systems, um, some ecology, some multiple choice practice, um, because that seems to be some things um, that people wanted to go over um, from last week. Um, remember that there are four other parts to this review that have already happened. So it's very possible that we've already covered something that you might be confused about, in which case all you need to do is watch my hour long replay and you'll be all caught up and ready to go. Um, and also remember that I've been making videos since September. So I don't know how many hours of video there are, probably 30 hours of video that you can go back and watch to help review. You just need a fiveable plus um, membership. So. That's all you need, and then you can, you know, watch me talk at you for hours upon hours upon hours these next 12 days before the exam. Um, let's see. Let's do some big picture stuff first. So um, you know that the exam is three hours long. It's happening on Monday, May 13th at 8 in the morning across the country, um, and that you have an hour and a half for multiple choice, a 10-minute break, and then an hour and a half for free response. Uh, multiple choice, there are 63 regular multiple choice questions and six grid in math questions. My suggestion to you is always to go to the grid in math questions first um, because you can't guess on them. You can pick C and bubble in any of the remaining multiple choice that you don't have time for, but you can't randomly bubble in a number for a grid in question and get a point for it. So what I always tell my students is to take a look at the grid in questions first. I would say in my experience of looking at 10 bajillion AP exams, um, usually there are three questions in the grid in that are really straightforward algebra. Perhaps it's finding a slope because they're asking you the rate of something um, or uh, some sort of genetics like cross, like Punnett square cross or just some other simple algebraic, sometimes you have to find the mean of something. Um, so those are really easy, free points is what I would call those, because uh, it's all basic algebra. Um, so I would just do a quick scan of um, your multiple choice questions, answer those three uh, that are easy, and then skip the more challenging ones. Um, depending on the person, like if you hate Hardy Weinberg, then don't answer the Hardy Weinberg questions. You're probably not gonna finish the test anyway, so it's not a huge stress if you don't get to it. Um, and there's like, sometimes they'll throw crazy hard questions in there. So you don't wanna spend an inordinate amount of time on the grid in questions because it's definitely not worth it to. Um, it's not worth it to spend an inordinate amount of time on any one question. I will remind you that they are all worth the same amount. Um, but give, give the grid ins a quick scan, find those three easy ones, get those done, um, and then move back to the multiple choice. Um, historically, also the multiple choice move from easy to medium to very challenging to more medium to easy. Um, so students oftentimes don't get to some of the easiest questions because they don't finish the test. And so this is also my ploy to tell you uh, to skip questions that you don't feel comfortable with. I can show you some of the questions that I always advise students to, to skip when we get to multiple choice practice. Um, but it's just a good strategy. Uh, and again, they're all worth the same amount. If you end up having time at the end, then go back and take your time on it. But it's not worth it in the moment. Okay, so those are just some broad multiple choice overview strategies. Uh, I will hash them out in more detail, especially in our cram sessions, which will happen the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night before the exam. Um, Addie. That's my dog. She's having a great time outside. Um, Okay, so for free response, there's eight of them. You have an hour and or sorry, an hour and thirty minutes as well. You have two long responses that they suggest you take twenty two minutes on. They're worth ten points each, and then there are six shorter responses, three of which are worth four points, three of which are worth three points, uh, which they suggest you spend anywhere between four and six minutes on. My suggestion for these is also to work backwards. Um, I always suggest that you start with question eight and move your back uh, way back up to question one. Um, I've talked to tons and tons of people who grade the AP tests, and they always say that they read like four or five pages of text 
for students for long free responses. Um, and those students are just rambling about something, trying to get something on the page. Uh, and they end up getting like a two, two points on that question out of 10. And they wasted maybe 45 minutes, maybe half their time writing those four pages. Um, so it's just not worth it. To, to ramble and panic on those long free response questions um, when there's easier points to get from the short free responses. So again, my suggestion is always gonna be to start with the short questions. They don't take very long and you can zoom through them pretty darn quickly. Um, and then um, move your way to those longer ones. When you get to the long questions, if you start running out of time, um, those long questions are usually three, four, or five parts. A couple of those parts are usually easy and require very little reading and very little writing. Uh, it may be constructing a graph, it may be answering a math question, it may be um, like an application on top of something. Um, but regardless, there's usually some easy points. I can usually find four or five easy points out of the 10 points. Um, that are available. So that's going to be my suggestion to you. Um, so that's just like my overview. Hopefully you find that somewhat helpful. Um, those are the strategies that I have used tried or true with my students. Um, they're great, but you know yourself, hopefully you've taken some practice tests so you know whether or not you usually finish the exam. If you usually finish the exam, then your strategies are going to look a little bit different than students who don't usually finish the exam um, because students who don't usually finish the exam are going to just have to be better about prioritizing in order to get the maximum amount of points. Um, usually it's around a 50% or a 55% on the test to get a three, um, like an 80% of possible points to get a five and then somewhere in between to get a four. So if you're shooting for those scores, know your metrics. Um, it's also kind of good to know because when I work with perfectionists, which I do because I teach AP students and I'm sure you're all perfectionists as well. They're like, I will not move on from this question. I have to get it right. And they spend five minutes on one multiple choice question that they maybe get right. And then they don't get to answer like five questions at the end. Um, you don't need to get that question right because you can get an 80% and still get a five. Um, so put your pride away for a little bit and just move past those questions um, if you get stuck, okay? Okay, phew, so those are my overall strategies. I saw someone asked about study tips. Um, I can definitely talk about those at the end too because I have some of my favorite study tips and study books. Um, I really like the Cliff's Notes uh, book, um, so I use that pretty frequently. I don't really like their practice questions because um, they're way too basic, but I really like the content that they cover. Um, so I can post a link to the book that I use with my students um, as well as some strategies that I have. Okay. Um, really quick, are there any topics that people really want me to cover? You can just write them in the chat box just so I have a direction. Um, otherwise, I'll pick back up where we left off last week, which was with the um, nervous system. Okay, evolution. That, okay, Cons conservation ecology. Oh, that's not going to be too much on the AP exam, so that's good. Um, study tips I see. Speciation. Okay, so lots of evolution questions. Genetics, what occurs in each phase. Okay. Edgar, you don't really need to know what occurs in each phase, so that's good. Endocrine system, I will talk about today for sure. Endocrine, ooh, lots of endocrine, that's perfect, because we're definitely gonna talk about that today. And cell communication, I will tell you, has been a huge, oh, you don't need to know the excretory system, Skylar, so that's good. I won't cover that one, because you don't need to know it. Um, Action potentials I'll definitely cover in a second. Evolution I can go through again. Homeostasis and endocrine I'm going to go through today. Hardy Weinberg I can go through. Light and dark cycles. Confused about that question, Peyton. Um, Hardy Weinberg. Okay, perfect. I'll go. I'll try to go through a lot of these. It sounds like a lot of people are interested in evolution, so maybe I'll cycle back some of those questions. Actually, the multiple choice that I picked out is evolution. I'm just remembering. So when we go through those, we can go through evolution as well. Okay, um, really quick before we get started, just some housekeeping. Anusha, I see you have a question about 2013 review books. As long as it was for the 2013 AP exam, you're good. That's when the test was redesigned. So anything 2013 and on is fair game. As long as it was a 2013 review book for the 2013 exam, you should be good to go. Okay, Anusha, uh, Anika also wondering about how much we need to know about the investigations. Not quite sure what you mean by investigations. Um, really the only one that you should come in with some sort of basic knowledge about um, is maybe the Griffith experiment with DNA and um, 
familiarity for origins of life, but for the most part, you don't need to come in with that knowledge because they'll provide the knowledge for you. You just need to understand what the key takeaways are. So as long as you can understand the key takeaway from um, the knowledge given to you, then you don't need to memorize any of those. Um, you shouldn't be memorizing a whole lot here. Um, it's all more application-based. Okay, I'll try to get through the majority of the things that you guys are asking. Um, so let's pick up, because I know we had people, a lot of people asking about endocrine system, which will be right after nervous system. Um, and I will go through that. Yeah, Ace, the crash course book is really good. Let me actually post that really, really quick so you guys can. Uh, crash course biology. And I'll put that on the side because again, that's the book. I actually have all of my students get one. Um, EP biology. And they can write in it. And again, the information is great. I think that the questions in it are way too easy. Um, they're like really basic multiple choice questions, which drives me crazy. Oh, that's not what I meant. But Crash Course is a great book. What did I say? Cliff's notes. There it is. Losing my mind. Is anyone else losing their mind during review season? I tell that to my students because I have office hours every day during review season. And so by the end of the day, I'm just like talking to myself and things are rough. Okay. Cool. Here's the book that I use. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to start reviewing just for the sake of time. So that we can get through this and then I can answer more of your questions. Um, okay, so nervous system, definitely want to talk about the action potential. So obviously the purpose of our nervous system is to transmit singles, signals throughout the body and react to the environment um, and to control the body and communicate through our various body systems, right? So it's our way of communication with the world and with ourselves and different parts of our body. Um, super, super important system that involves the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and then peripheral, which is everything that comes off of that. Okay, uh, you want to be generally familiar with the neuron, just because I've seen some questions that refer to like the myelin sheaths and, and axon terminals and synapses and things like that. Um, so you have your nucleus and cell body up by the dendrites, um, multiple dendrites. I'm sorry, I'm going to go get my dog because she's barking and it's really good. Oh, so multiple dendrites, one axon, that's because neurons can um, receive multiple messages, but they only send one response message. Um, you'll notice that the axon is coded by the myelin sheath, um, but is produced by Schwann cells, Schwann cells. Um, and it's like a fatty layer that protects our axon and most importantly insulates it. And what that does is allows us to send messages quick enough that we can continue to stay alive because it allows our signal to actually jump between these little uh, unwrapped gaps called the nodes of Ranvier, which you don't need to know, but there it is for you. Um, and you can think about this like an insulated wire that has just like little parts cut out, and that's what the signal jumps through. Okay, so that's kind of important to know. And then what happens at the end is important to know as well, but we'll get there when we get to the end. Okay. All right, so just briefly, types of neurons. Um, something that the AP exam is really big about is that form fits function. So the, the shape and size and parts of something fit what it does. And so you can see that with our sensory relay and motor neurons. Um, our motor neurons have a lot of dendrites and then this long, powerful axon that ends uh, with our muscle neurons, or with our muscle um, cells, sorry. Our sensory neurons um, have a lot more axon than anything else, and they have the cell body in the middle because they're integrating a very much more complex set, uh, signal from a receptor cell that's going to be located in the eye or the ears or something along that nature. And then our relay uh, or interneurons are going to be in between, and you notice that they have the most dendrites and the most um, terminals at the end because they are responsible for integrating all of our signals so that they need to receive and send lots and lots of signals. So most important thing to remember about everything in our body is that form fits the function. So whatever it does, um, it, should, it should be shaped to do that job. 
Okay, so basic information pathway, we're gonna have some sort of sensory input. We're gonna integrate in the brain somewhere in the central nervous system. If it's not the brain, it might be in the spinal cord. If it's a reflex, um, it will just go through the spinal cord, which is why it's so quick and why you don't have to think about it. So I've seen a lot of um, AP questions that dwell on this point. Um, there was one in the 2018 practice exam, if you've taken that, uh, that talks about um, the use of a reflex and it shows you the reflex pathway and how it only goes through the spinal cord and why that's evolutionarily beneficial right when you put your hand on a hot stove you're not like oh my gosh this stove is really hot i should pull my hand away right no your hand just pulls away because that's a reflex and it's because it doesn't actually have to get integrated in your brain it just goes right through your spinal cord and leads to the motor output um, which is going to be your peripheral nervous system again um, signaling a muscle to contract or pull away Okay, so just something to keep in mind there because I've actually seen that very recently on a practice test. Here, um, sorry, I forgot that I had the slide next, is a reflex. So again, just traveling through the spinal cord. Um, and again, it's much, much uh, faster because it has a shorter distance to travel and it happens without you thinking about it. It's an innate response, which is again, evolutionarily beneficial. Okay, so how do we transmit a signal? Um, the way that I like to think about this is like Legos. Um, so let me just make sure no one has a question about what I've said so far. So far, Matthew, I will definitely answer that, I promise. Um, okay. Cool. And I also have predictions about this year's free response question. So I'll get there as well. Okay. So how do we transmit a signal? Um, so again, I think about this like dominoes. So you set up a bunch of dominoes, uh, and the second you tip them over, it's an all or nothing response, they all fall down. But it does take a, a little bit of a push in the beginning to get them falling. And then if you, wanna re, if you want to re-hit those dominoes down, you need to reset them and put them all back up, okay? So start the start of this, protein channels open up. Um, after they open, it's an all or nothing response, okay? So we're, we're sending the darn signal. Then we have propagation, which is a positive wave down the neuron. Uh, and we'll talk about the membrane's polarization in a second. And then we reset by repolarizing the membrane, making it more negative so that we can have another action potential come along next. So at rest, what you need to know is that the neuron is a salty banana. Okay, and that is the easiest way to remember where potassium and where sodium is inside of a neuron. So inside of the cell, you'll see that we have a ton of potassium. That's our banana. Outside of the cell, we have tons of sodium. That's our salty, salty banana. Okay, so you'll never forget that sodium is on the outside of the neuron and potassium is in the inside of the neuron at rest. Okay, and we'll notice the sodium potassium pump is going through some active transport and forcing more potassium in, which is not where it wants to go, and more sodium out, which is also not where it wants to go. Then we have some protein channels that are letting things in at will. Okay, so knowing this, you also need to know that um, at resting potential, which is down here, our neurons are at negative 70 millivolts. And that's for a couple different reasons. Um, there's a lot of anions inside of the cell, and you can see it's negatively charged on the inside and positively charged on the outside. And we also have more positive sodium outside than we do have positive potassium, positive potassium on the inside. So there's a very large negative uh, membrane potential um, for these reasons, okay? So when we're at rest, we're at negative 70. Okay. When some sort of stimulus comes through, and it could be any number of things, it could be a neurotransmitter, um, it could be something like acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter that triggers our muscles, um, or it could be that a po it, the positive charge of the, um, the cell next to it, so it's just, or not the cell next to it, but the portion of the axon next to it is propagating this signal. Whatever it is, once we start to get positive because of whatever signal that was sent, um, we're going to have some sodium gates pop open. If the sodium gates pop open, we're going to have a lot more of these guys pop open. Okay? Sodium is going to come rushing into the membrane. Sodium is positively charged, Na+. So when it comes rushing into the membrane, we have depolarization. Sodium channels are open, potassium channels are closed, and we get really nice and positive up in here. Okay? We actually make it all the way up to positive 40. That's depolarization. So polarized right, means that we have an unequal distribution of charge. So depolarization, we're getting more positive, okay? Then as, as time goes on, those sodium channels are gonna close and the potassium channels are a little slower to the game, but they will open up kind of a split second later, right? When they open up, 
potassium flows out, right? If that's where it wants to go. We have a high concentration and a low concentration. So it flows out. And you'll see that the negative, the membrane starts getting nice and negative again because we're losing positive charge. We're losing potassium because it is leaving. And then we have a little bit of this hyperpolarization. Uh, the potassium channels open up just a little slightly too long. Um, so we actually get slightly more negative than negative 70, which is A-OK, -okay, because this is kind of what prevents us from accidentally then sending the signal back up to the front. Okay, it kind of prevents us and kind of locks the cell from, from sending it back up to the dendrites where it's not going to do anything. Uh, and then our sodium potassium pump is finally going to bring us back to rest. Um, and that's going to do that by, again, pumping sodium out, salty, pumping potassium in, banana. Okay, so it's going to reestablish our concentration gradient, which is what makes it possible for us to go through this process again. If we didn't reset, then it wouldn't matter when the sodium channels opened the next time because sodium would already be where it wants to be. Okay, so we have to force it back out so that when we open the sodium channels again, it will come rushing in and we'll see the depolarization of the membrane. Any questions about that? No, I love action potentials. And once you break it down and actually think about it, it makes a whole lot more sense. Um, so that's what I kind of always try to tell my students. It's it's not um, it's not like super smart just to like sit and memorize stuff because then you're not going to be able to apply it to a new situation. And this AP exam is designed so that you can apply things to new situations. Um, so yeah, what makes the pumps work? Great question, Tiffany. ATP, one of the major. Um, uses of ATP. Yep. Yeah. So it's active transport, right? Because we're forcing things against their concentration gradient. We're forcing sodium out where it doesn't want to go because there's already lots of sodium out there. We're forcing potassium in where it doesn't want to go. Active transport, it uses ATP. Um, and again, one of the major reasons, uh, one of the major users of ATP. Okay. Awesome. So if you can remember some of these things, um, it'll make it a whole lot easier to uh, understand the action potential. How do we go from undershoot to resting? That's gonna be the sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump is going to equalize that. So once we get too negative, it will pump some more sodium or some more potassium back in and some more sodium out and it'll just kind of equalize, um, mainly by pumping more, more potassium in um, so that we're not too negative. Ooh, pumps and channels. Great question. Um, so a pump is used usually in active transport to force something against its concentration gradient. And you can see just by the shape of this um, that uh, this, this closes on the outside. And that's because we don't want sodium to come back in and we don't want potassium to go back out. Okay, so this closes and therefore forces things to go in a different direction and pumps are gonna use ATP. Channels are just like big open holes, okay? It's just like an open door or a door frame with no door in it, okay? So you can't force potassium to not go through that unless it closes and they do. It's kind of like an elevator door so they can like close like this, in which case then potassium can't leave. But when it's open, all it's doing is providing a portal for sodium or for potassium or sodium to go through, okay? But it's not regulating and, and it can never pump, pump something. It can never do active transport because it's just a big open hole. So things are just gonna go from high to low concentration through it. It just provides the means for it to get through the membrane. Remember, charged things cannot get through the membrane because of the fatty acid tails. Okay, so these charged things are unable to get through the membrane on their own. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any action potentials because this would just be at equilibrium because sodium and potassium would just equalize themselves out. But they can't do that. Um, they have to go through these protein channels, and that's what gives the, the concentration gradients. Ooh, so calcium is going to be used, no problem. Um, calcium is going to be used for the most part in our muscle cells. So let me see if I can find a picture of that. And mm -hmm. There are some pretty good diagrams of this. Although I don't see it on there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. This is actually what happens at the at the very end. So I actually might have a picture here, although I don't know if it has calcium on it, but I can show you what the role of calcium is. Ooh, let me go through this first, and then we'll talk about the, the calcium, I promise, because it happens all the way at the end with the synaptic terminals. 
Okay, so what you're seeing here, action potential, so sodium comes in, makes it nice and positive, and that's going to pop open voltage-gated ion channels along this. Voltage-gated ion channels legitimately open up when there's positive charge, just like people open up to other positive people, right? And then, of course, potassium leaves, which makes it, it negative, which is going to prevent um, this from going in the wrong direction. And then where you see red again is where the sodium potassium pump is equalizing this situation. And you can see this is going to travel all the way down the axon then, all the way to the end where we get the synaptic terminal, which is where we can talk about calcium and neurotransmitters. Okay, um, charge activated channels. So Karen, that's a great question. Um, I have not heard of any charge activated pumps, but charge activated channels um, truly um, based on the, and this gets like way more complex than you need to know, but based on the charges of the protein channels, um, there's usually one positive and one negative um, side of the channel. So they kind of like stick together like a magnet. And then when the positive charge comes in, it um, kind of neutralizes that negative charge and therefore these guys are gonna repel one another and it opens up. Um, so that's kind of how that works. But again, that goes beyond the scope of something that you would have to understand for the exam. Okay, oh, there's calcium, it is here. Look at that, planned accordingly. Okay, so the charge gets all the way to the end. And basically what happens all the way at the end is so that positive charge is traveling through and what it finally signals is for these calcium channels to open. And when that happens, calcium enters into the end and allows the release of synaptic vesicles that are carrying some sort of neurotransmitter. In this case, it's acetylcholine. So you can see then that we're trying to trigger a, mus a muscle cell um, and so these little uh, neurotransmitters, which just exist in little vesicles at the end of axons, get activated by the calcium, and then they get released through this little gap. I kind of think of this as like Red Rover, if you ever played that in like elementary school, terribly dangerous game. Okay, so they're traveling across the synapse, and then they're binding to um, little receptor-gated channels on this side that once, so you can see this one's closed, but when it binds to the neurotransmitter, it opens up, and this is gonna start an action potential in this cell that will allow this muscle to contract. Cool. There's your nervous system for you. It's truly the majority of what you would need to know. Any other questions about the nervous system stuff? You guys have asked such great questions so far. I'm very impressed. It bodes well for you. I know there's a lot of still unanswered questions in the ask a question section, which I will totally cover. I just want to get through, I'm going to try to get through um, the endocrine system since so many people had a question about it, and then I'll pull up your questions and start working through them if that works for you guys. I might have to do ecology next week, we'll see. Okay, if there's no other questions, then let's hop on through. Oh, sorry, can I ask? Oh, Caroline. <laughs> I'm Caroline, or Miss Sheep. Uh, my last name's Sheep, like the animal. Um, let's see. Do you have to know the specifics of this whole process with neurons? Um, you should be definitely be familiar with the action potential. Um, definitely be familiar with the action potential. Yeah, I mean, everything that I just said, you should be relatively familiar with. I've seen, like, too many free responses on the nervous system. I forget what year it was, but there was like three about the nervous system in a row. Let me try to find it really quick. It may have been 2015. Um, you guys know that all of the free responses are online, hopefully with their answer keys. Um, so like a huge thing that my kids and I do is just go through those and see what the answer keys look like. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to like, be real with you some of these answer keys are absolutely bogus like they're like the points I'm like why is that a point like I just took one the other day with my kids I missed I don't know like a point on a couple questions uh, and I teach this class so there are some where you're just like what and it's okay you can still get a high five and like a like a high high five and and miss some points um, but it's good to see the rubrics and see what they're looking for because a lot of times you know the thing, uh, but you just don't write it down because they don't specifically ask for it, and that's really, really frustrating. So that's why I have my students practice with rubrics all the time. Calculation of action potential. Uh, Krizia, what do you what do you mean by that? Like the numbers themselves, like negative 70 and 40? You just need to go that, know, know that it goes from negative to positive, that it depolarizes. But that's pretty much it. You don't like have to memorize the numbers. Just as long as you know that our membrane is naturally negative and then it turns positive. Okay, I found it. It is the 2015 free response. The, 
this year may be my least favorite free responses. Um, and Naya, I might review it tonight or next week. It depends on how long it takes me to get through other questions, um, but definitely next week at the latest for ecology. Okay, so if you take a look at the 2015 free response that I just sent, uh, sent you the link for, you'll notice that the, um, let's see, the first question asks, um, asks about the nervous system in part A. It says the nervous system plays a role in coordinating the observed activity pattern of the mice in response to light-dark stimuli. Describe one role of each of the following anatomical structures in response to light-dark stimuli, a photoreceptor, a brain, in a motor neuron. So none of those are like overly complex, but that talks about the nervous system. Then down in, oh, then there's a really crazy uh, cellular respiration question that everyone hated. Um, this mitosis meiosis question everyone hated. Yeah, this was a tough year. This was a tough year. Wait, is that it? I thought there was two more. Ah, here we go. Question seven is all about the nervous system. Describe how the signal is transmitted across the synapse from an olfactory sensory neuron to the inner neuron that transmits the information to the brain and explain how the expression of a limited number of odorant receptor genes can lead to the perception of thousands of odors. Um, so alternative splicing was one of the things that you could talk about there. Um, and then uh, question eight was all about the immune system. So this was like a real heavy body system. Um, FRQ. So you can take a look through that. Obviously, all the answers are there. Um, just to kind of get an idea of the depth that you would need to know the nervous system for. It's not saying that, you know, you won't have to go deeper or less deep than that, but it's a starting point. Okay. Zachary, that's a great question. I can post some ones that I have that are not college board ones. So the problem with the college board practice tests is that they are under lock and key. Like we could lose our job as AP educators if we post them anywhere. Um, so the teachers can can legitimately use them um, as assessments in class and not like have to fear that their kids can find the answers online. Um, so I haven't seen any that are released besides the one that like I have under lock and key, but I do have some practice tests that I can share with you guys from a different company um, that I work with. Um, they're not like perfect, but it's better than any of the study guides that I've seen. So um, I'll be right back. Someone just buzzed. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. Okay. <clears throat> Seb, great question. I would assume there's going to be maybe a body system on the free response. Um, I don't know. And I also don't know the extent that they're cutting it. I mean, I know they're cutting it as a unit, but I don't know. Uh, that's because they're going to make like an AP um, anatomy and physiology. I feel like they must be because otherwise, why would you cut my favorite unit? Um, but I would say there'll probably be a body systems FRQ. This goes back to someone else's question about my predictions for FRQs. I, I would be hard pressed to believe that there won't be a chi-squared question on there. Um, there hasn't been one since 2013. Um, so, yeah, it's not, not great when you don't see something for like six years, probably means it's coming. Um, so that's another one of my predictions. Um, they're always gonna do something that's based on a current event. They're always gonna have to have you analyze a um, experiments. Um, so those will definitely be coming. Um, I don't know if it'll be super body systems heavy because it was in 2015, maybe. <sighs> I don't know. My predictions are just predictions. Don't take them for, you know, the utmost truth because they may not be. But yeah, those are some of my thoughts and we can continue to talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Does the Campbell book contain everything? Yeah, the Campbell book contains way, 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 way more. If you're talking about like bi like Campbell biology or even biology and focus, um, that contains way more that information than you will need to know for the AP exam. Um, that's why I think review books are great because they're way more succinct. Um, but yeah, everything that's in there, uh, I mean, if you knew the entire book, then yes, you would get a five for sure. Okay. How does impulse go to another? Oh, Matthew, hopefully I answered this question already with uh, the neurotransmitter. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I'm trying to crank some of these out. Um, okay, for not finishing, my best suggestion for you is to, not finishing the free response, sorry. Um, my best suggestion for you is always gonna be to start with the short responses and move to the long responses because you'll end up using a lot less time on the long responses but still getting the same amount of points. That's my suggestion there. 
Okay, yes, yeah, so I will start endocrine. Here we go. And chi square, I'll definitely do as well. If I can't do it today, I'll do it next week for sure um, because it's not as hard as you think it is. I guarantee it. Okay, endocrine system, here we go. So endocrine is actually a lot less confusing than you might think. Um, yeah, but really what you need to know is some cell signaling stuff. So I may actually need to pull up some additional slides and post them in here um, to make sure that you guys have a clear and consistent understanding of cell signaling, uh, which seems overly complicated, but ends up not being as bad as it sounds, right? So the purpose of the endocrine system as a whole, um, it's, a, it's a family of glands that produce hormones to regulate the activity of cells and organs. So they regulate, they regulate growth, metabolism, sexual development, and they maintain homeostasis. So you can see them on the right. Um, you don't need to have all of these memorized. You don't need to know all the hormones that are made by all of them. Again, the new AP exam is much more about you being able to think critically. My favorite thing about the endocrine system is usually they provide you all the information in the question so that you can answer it as long as you're following along. Um, you usually don't need to come in like that you're never gonna need to know um, that calcitonin is involved in calcium regulation. Um, they would tell you that calcitonin is involved in ca uh, calcium regulation. You just need to put together the dots to figure out like what kind of regulation is happening and why. Um, so hopefully that helps qualm some nerves. And that water potential, I can that'll be like the last possible topic that I cover because it hardly ever shows up. And if it does show up, it's like one grid in question. So it's not usually worth it. But if I have time at the very end, I will cover it. Okay, so you need to be familiar with the difference between negative and positive feedback. Um, so negative feedback, some examples, temperature regulation, blood glucose levels, water limitations in plants. Basically, when you're deciding between negative and positive feedback, you want to think if the stimulus is decreased or increased by the response. Okay, so for whatever reason, students sometimes get this confused. So like temperature regulation, let's take a look at that. So when your body temperature falls, your blood vessels constrict, your sweat glands do not secrete anything, and you start to shiver, which is going to produce heat in your muscles, which forms your body. You gain more heat, and you maintain that normal body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. When your temperature rises, your blood vessels dilate so that you can lose heat to the environment. Your sweat glands start secreting so that we have evaporative cooling, and heat is lost from the body, okay? Um, so then your body returns to that normal 98.6. Now, for whatever reason, students sometimes get confused because they think body temperature falls and then it increases. So since it's increasing, that has to be positive feedback. It's not because the stimulus is that your body temperature falls. So if your body temperature continued to fall, then that would be negative feed, or then that would be positive feedback because we're increasing the stimulus of the temperature going down. But we're not increasing the stimulus of the temperature going down. We're decreasing the stimulus by bringing the temperature back up. So anytime you're trying to maintain homeostasis, no matter what, if it's going high, too high and you come back down or too low and you're going back up, whatever that is, it's negative feedback, okay? So temperature regulation is a good one to know about. It's also important, I can just like throw in here really quickly, ectotherms versus endotherms. Endotherms being those like warm blooded creatures that do not get energy from the environment. They create it themselves internally and maintain a stable body temperature and a stable level of respiration. I just saw this on a practice question where they had a graph um, that showed levels of respiration increasing as temperature increased, and you needed to be able to analyze that and say that that is an ectotherm because their metabolism is going to um, fluctuate with the environmental temperature. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be them versus us. Okay, I see your cell signaling question. I get there, I'll promise. It's just hard for me to continue to work through things and then keep jumping and taking tangents. Um, but cell signaling, we'll, we'll certainly talk about. I'll, I'll throw some, a few slides on at the end because that's important and related to endocrine. Okay, um, negative feedback. Um, another key example here that is often brought in, and again, they give you the information. You just need to be able to analyze it, uh, is with sugar regulation, so insulin and glucagon. Um, so what you'll see here is if blood glucose levels get too high, our pancreas releases insulin, and this does a few things. It stimulates, it stimulates glucose uptake by the cells, and it stimulates glycogen formation. Glycogen is just packaged glucose that gets stored in the liver and or muscle cells. So if we're taking glucose out of the uh, blood and putting it in the liver and muscles and tissues, um, then our blood glucose is going to hit back to that normal range. 
On the flip side, if you haven't eaten in a while, if you're one of those people who stands up and gets really lightheaded, you might have normally low blood sugar. When your blood sugar decreases, the pancreas releases glucagon, which is the hormone that's gonna stimulate the breakdown of all that stored glycogen and other glucose that will be then released back into the blood until we get back up to a normal blood sugar. Remember, blood sugar is gonna be really, really important because we need that glucose to go through cellular respiration to make ATP to continue to function. So if you're working out a lot, you're burning a lot of ATP, you're breaking down a lot of glucose, you're gonna to need to eat more frequently um, in order to replenish and maintain your normal blood glucose levels. Okay. Okay, positive feedback on the other hand is going to be when we increase the stimulus. So you're increasing a stimulus after, um, or your response is increasing the stimulus. So some examples of this, onset of labor, lactation, fruit ripening, clotting uh, in the body, all of those are gonna be examples of positive feedback. Okay, so here's an example of lactation and um, onset of labor. So when, um, when a child is about to be born, their head presses against the cervix. When their head presses against the cervix, we release prostaglandins, which makes uh, the mom release oxytocin, which, um, stimulates the brain to secrete even more oxytocin, so oxytocin leading to more oxytocin, okay? So positive feedback. Our stimulus is leading to more of that thing. Oxytocin is going to induce contractions, which is gonna make the baby's head press against the cervix even more, which releases prostaglandins, which release more oxytocin, which release more oxytocin, and here we go. Until the stimulus is removed, the stimulus being the baby, okay? Baby's removed, then we stop. Um, same thing with prolactin and oxytocin um, in um, breastfeeding. The more the baby sucks, the more uh, the brain produces prolactin and oxytocin, and the more milk is produced. So it goes over and over and over again. Um, so again, the stimulus is being increased by the response. Cool. Okay, so how do hormones actually signal? So I think this is what some, some of you were asking about. And then I'll throw up, I have um, some other slides that I can pop in here and show you guys. Um, so what happens here, and it depends on the type of signal, it depends on if it's like something like a hormone which can get through the plasma membrane, or if it's something that can't get through the plasma membrane. Um, here you can see the hormone gets into the plasma membrane and binds with its receptor. And that hormone receptor complex is actually gonna be responsible for activating DNA polymerase, or RNA polymerase, I should say, uh, to go through the process of transcription and then translation into whatever protein that hormone was signaling to be made, okay? So this process in and of itself is very, very similar anytime. So you should always be familiar that a cell signal is going to lead to some second messengers, and I can talk about CAMP and other second messengers in a second, um, that are going to lead to some response. That response is usually activating transcription to make a protein. So remember that that's, those are the doers of the cell, the proteins, okay? Um, like even when um, some of my students were getting confused the other day about questions that involve like uh, genetic situations um, where you have this dominant allele and this recessive allele, um, you wanna think about what an allele actually is. It's just a gene, it's just a, a, a code of DNA and that DNA does nothing until it's turned into protein. But oftentimes a recessive allele just, just doesn't code for a protein or it codes for a protein that's degraded, we're not made or mutated or whatever it is. So if you're a carrier, you can get away with it because your other version of that gene can produce enough protein to continue to make you normal. But if your homozygote is recessive, then you're not making any of that critical protein and therefore you're not able to do whatever it is that that gene was supposed to do. Um, so that's like kind of an important thing because I think we, we get so caught up with thinking of genetics as like, big A and little a, and that means you're heterozygous. And we don't think about what that actually means genetically, meaning like the DNA is actually being turned into protein and usually a recessive gene is just not making a protein, et cetera. Okay, right? cool. All right, let me throw up a few, oh, positive feedback. What will cause positive feedback to stop? Um, it will keep going, yes. And um, what makes it stop is usually the stimulus is removed, right? So in the two examples I gave you, either the baby is born and therefore the stimulus is removed or the baby stops breastfeeding and then the stimulus is removed. Um, 
Yeah, same with like you have a cut, and so your body is sending out signals that you're cut, and so that's going to lead to positive feedback, which is going to send more and more and more and more platelets and other things to the area until the cut is healed, and then we don't need to continue to do that. So it's whenever the stimulus is removed. Okay. Let me just pull up. Let me find this slide deck really quick. So communication. Here it is. The regular PowerPoint. So sometimes these are slow. Let me see if this will work. I might have to convert it or copy some slides. I wonder if I can do that. Now I'm just talking to myself. I hate Google Slides with a burning passion. So it's hard for me to um, use this and not use PowerPoint. So let's see if this works. You guys have to keep me posted. So whatever. Oof, now I'm really big. And you can see that my hair's all over the place. Went for a run before this. Look like a mess. Okay. All right, do we see the slide? Yes, we do, okay. Now this is usually where it gets stuck, and unfortunately it gets stuck where I can't see it. So let's just look, we'll go through communication real quick. Mm, yeah, it's still stuck on the first slide. What the heck, why does it do that? Hmm, okay. Let me see if I can real quick copy these slides into my Google Slides, let's see. I think by now I could like figure out technology, but the answer is no, I can't. Oh, Ooh, it just copied one picture. That's annoying. Gosh darn it. Hmm. Okay, I'll just copy the most important slides then. Give me half a second. You can be thinking of questions while I try to do this so that I can answer some of your questions because visuals are real important. Um, so, copy these in. Uh, mm -hmm. You guys can start answering your own or each other's questions too if you really want. Um, All right, we should be good to go. Oof, gosh, it's already 7.47. Whew, time flies. Okay. Here we go. We back. Sorry, they're a little small. I didn't take the time to make them all bigger because, well, time is of the essence. We only have 13 minutes left together. Okay, so cell signaling, which is what a couple of you had asked. Oh, there we go. Um, stages of cell signaling. So we have three main stages, reception, transduction, and a response. So reception, usually we have our receptor molecule that's embedded in the plasma membrane because our receptors can't just enter any old cell on their own, or the signal, sorry, can't just enter any old cell on their own. Signal fits receptor. Again, this is a perfect example of um, form fits function. Okay, they fit together. That's very critical. Um, and then that specific combination will lead to a specific trans signal transduction pathway, which is just a glorified relay race that leads to some sort of response. I have some examples of some cellular responses to make a little bit more sense of that. Okay, so reception. Reception begins with the signal interacting with the receptor. Um, usually non-steroid, so steroid hormones can enter into all cells because they can get through the plasma membrane because they're in the lipid family, okay, and therefore they're able to get through the plasma membrane without a receptor, but most things attach to the receptor and cause a change in the shape, um, and therefore lead to the signal construction. So let me make this one a little bigger. This is important. So transduction is next, which is, I think, what you guys were mainly talking about. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay. So transduction is next. I know this is a little blurry. So we have these little relay proteins, okay, that are going to get activated. So they're going to get activated by something on the receptor. Maybe the receptor has a GTP or an ATP or a phosphate of some sort that is tagging this relay protein and therefore starting the signal cascade. 
Okay. And again, it's basically like a relay race. Okay, so what you'll see is we have this active relay protein, and then we have an inactive protein kinase that gets activated by the relay protein by stealing its phosphate. You can think of the phosphate as like the baton. So you have to pass the baton before your partner can move. So you'll notice inactive protein kinase 2 is not active yet because it hasn't gotten the baton or the phosphate from, phosphate from active protein kinase 1. A kinase is just something that phosphorylates something else. Phosphorylation is just adding a phosphate. So all a kinase does is grabs phosphate and transfer them. Grabs phosphate and transfers it. Okay, so kinase 1 is going to transfer a phosphate to kinase 2. It would then become inactive, and we have an active protein kinase 2. This is like your second or your third relay runner, okay? And then we have inactive protein kinase 3 waiting. It gets the baton or the, or the phosphate from protein kinase 2, and it gets activated. And that's going to lead to a transcription factor being activated, and you can see it's active because it has this little phosphate. You'll notice that most of the activation here is phosphate-based, and then that transcription factor is able to transcribe mRNA, which is going to make a protein, which is going to lead to the actual response. Okay. Cool. Where does the phosphate come from? Probably from the receptor. The receptor probably has an ATP or a GTP that transfers um, a phosphate. Okay, cool. Hopefully that helps those that were acting about this. So the different responses then that can happen, ultimately we're activating an enzyme or we have a synthesis of a particular enzyme or protein by activating a gene. That's going to be more common. Um, yeah, but usually we have some sort of biochemical pathway, especially when CAMP is involved or calcium. Um, it's generally followed by interacting with a specific enzyme to start the cascade of a pathway. So I think I have, so this is a good example of, I don't know why these are so blurry, but you know what, we'll make do. Um, we can have multiple responses uh, or the same response for different things. So you'll see here cell A, just a straight one signal, one response. Cell B, one signal, two different responses with two different signals. Okay, that happens sometimes. Um, in the cell, we have um, two different signals actually leading to the same response, or maybe this one's activating and this one's inhibiting. Um, but all, all in all, you can see kind of the, the regular transduction here. Signal molecules or relay molecules could be kinases or CAMP. A cyclic AMP is just another thing that can be phosphorylated and therefore act as a relay molecule or a member of the team in the real race. Okay, um, so you can see this something similar here. This is an example of a light signal pathway in plants. And you can see that we have a couple different things going on here. So we have light activating um, a phytochrome, we have a calcium channel opening up, and we have uh, protein kinases being activated as well as second messengers. So this is cyclic GMP, um, which is, is going to do the same thing as cyclic AMP, um, but they're both activating uh, protein kinases that are leading to transcription factors, which are creating um, proteins that are doing things. Um, so that's really the long and short of it. Um, it's not as, quite as complicated as, I, as it may seem. Okay, let me try to answer all these questions now. Hmm. Let's see if I can. Seven minutes. Let's do it. Okay, Mira, the great news about ecology is if you can read a graph and you can think logically, you can do ecology also. We did not have time tonight, but I will make it the first topic of next week's review. But truly, um, as long as you can understand basic relationships uh, and read a graph, ecology should be the least of your problems. Um, with evolution, I would grab yourself a review book um, so that you can kind of dive in there. Um, yeah. I don't know. Evolution is really, really important. So there's really nothing you can do more than like deep dive study. Seb, you do not need to know about this. Okay. The diagrams I just showed I got from National Math and Science Initiative. I will review ecology next week, I promise. Speciation I will go through next week, um, but, but truly the most important thing that you can know about speciation is that the definition of a species is that it's two organisms that are not able to, to reproduce to make offspring that are living and fertile. 
okay? Um, so viable and fertile. So they can't make babies and they can, or they're not alive. Um, so that's gonna be the main thing there. And the main aspects of speciation is going to be preventing gene flow between two populations that are going through the speciation process. So that's what makes allopatric speciation more common. Those populations are separate geographically, so they're not gonna be trying to mate with one another, right? It's like long distance. If you break up with one another and you go far away, it's gonna be way easier to forget them than if you see them around the hallway all the time, okay? So allopatric speciation is going to separate that from um, each other. Okay, so Eduardo, that's my like brief explanation, but come back next week and I'll try to review more for you. Okay, answered my predictions for FRQs. Definitely chi-squared, probably something body systems, and you'll definitely need to analyze a, an experiment. Plasmid mapping, I would suggest you do not waste time on memorizing something like that. I would spend time focusing on something else. I cannot imagine that they would incorporate it in the exam, um, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay. The stream next week will be, I think it's my last one. Yes, I think it's my last one that's free. I'm pretty sure. I'll double check on that. But next week should be the last one that's free. But next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday um, will be only for Fiveable Plus members. So I'll have like last minute cram sessions. So that's uh, really a, a solid way to, to um, review because I can answer all these questions for you um, the three days leading up to the For the labs, how in-depth should you know them? Not very in-depth, I would say. Again, as long as you understand the general concept, you could have never done the lab before and you should still be able to answer the questions. So if you're like wildly confused about what's going on in like cellular respiration, then you need to review that lab. But as long as you understand cellular respiration, you should be able to look at a graph of a lab that you've never done and be able to answer the questions just fine. Um, so, yeah. Key points for evolution, ooh, yo, yo, too many to name. Natural selection, genetic variation, genetic drift, gene flow, um, macroevolution and microevolution and then their entirety, speciation, um, origin of life, um, common ancestors, cladograms, phylogenetic trees, e, all of it. Evolution's the biggest, easily the biggest topic on the exam. Okay. Let's see. Okay, study tips. Um, so my favorite study tip personally is to find like a great review book that has really good reviews and go through it chapter by chapter. Um, this is how I got through college. I was a microbiology major. So if you know anything about microbiology, it is fully memorizing everything that has ever existed. Um, so how I got through that is going through things like uh, review books and um, writing down everything that I didn't know. And then I'd read through all of my notes and rewrite only the things that I still didn't know. And then I'd read through my notes and only write through the things I still didn't know until I had a list of nothing. So that's my favorite. Um, I think it's really, really good because you're just writing and rewriting and learning and thinking about the things that you know the least, the most. Um, and trusting yourself on the things that you do know. Um, I'm a big fan of Bozeman. I would highly, highly recommend watching his videos. Um, he's really, really great and does a great job. See someone said Amoeba Sisters. I, I love Amoeba Sisters, they're wonderful. They don't go into the depth that you need for AP, but if you're struggling with more basic concepts, they're great. Um, textbook's fine. Um, practice exams are great. I would say you should have looked through every single practice FRQ from 2013 through 2018 and their answer guides, um, just because that's a really, really great way um, to make sure that uh, you know kind of what College Board looks for. Um, for Heidi Weinberg and Chi-Square, um, I can teach you how to do Heidi Weinberg really easily with a Punnett Square, so I can do that next week. It's super, super simple. Um, Chi-Square, I can definitely go through next week also. I promise it's not as confusing as you think it is um, at all. So I can try to go through both of those with you um, next week. God, we have just one week left and we have to get through all of ecology. Holy crap. Definitely sign up for my cram sessions because, um, yeah, they're, they're, we're not going to be able to cover everything just in one hour next week. Um, so those are my study tips. The Barron's book, I have only briefly looked through, so I can't highly recommend or not recommend it. If anyone else has um, used the Barron's book, maybe they could speak more highly of that or not highly of that. 
Scrim sessions will be an hour, so I'll do one um, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night, or like Saturday, I think I'm doing it at 5 p.m. Central maybe, so 6 p.m. Eastern, and then I think I'm doing 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern on both Friday and, let me write this down, sorry. So it'll be, I think it's Friday at p.m. Central, which would be 7 p.m. Eastern, and I know a lot of you are in California, so that would be 4 p.m. What's your, what, what is that called? Pacific time? Pacific. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Okay, then Saturday I'll do 5 p.m. I think Central, which would be 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, and Sunday, I'm doing 6 p.m. again. I have to watch Game of Thrones that night. Sorry, guys. I mean, hopefully you understand. Okay. Perfect. So those are my those are my times um, for for the cram sessions. Okay. What's up with hemoglobin and oxygen? That's a really interesting question and not something that you need to know a ton about. But hemoglobin is the uh, structure that with iron, hemoglobin and iron, that grab onto oxygen molecules in the red blood cells and transfer oxygen throughout the body. Why do we need oxygen? Because it's the final electron acceptor for the electron transport chain. It's one of my favorite questions to ask kids. Um, I'll be like, hey, why do we need oxygen? And they're like, to breathe. And I'm like, yeah, but why? And they're like, to stay alive. And I'm like, yeah, but why? The answer is for the final electron acceptor of the electron transport chain. <gasps> Got through all your questions. It's amazing. All right, y'all. You're a great crew. You're also very engaged with one another. So thank you for that. And thank you for answering some of each other's questions and providing suggestions. You guys are all going to do great, OK? Spent a couple hours this weekend studying. Um, it's really, really important. I also tell my students, I don't know, this is kind of random, but I tell my students to wake up at eight in the morning to study either on Saturday or Sunday for the next you know, two weekends um, so that your brain is active and engaged at 8 a.m. Um, because that's when it needs to be for the AP exam. Obviously, you're up that early for school, but it's nice to study AP material at that time. I don't know why, but I just like, it feels like good vibes because then your brain is ready to engage in that material at 8 a.m. on Monday. Um, because that's not an easy thing to ask about or ask of you. Um, so definitely study this weekend. Definitely come up with a list of questions that you want to ask next week, especially at cram sessions, um, because I'll have three hours of time to devote to you. Um, I'll definitely review ecology first thing next week um, and then do some math practice as well. Okay. Y'all are great. Take a deep breath. Take 10 deep breaths. You're going to do great things. I believe in you. You should believe in yourself. You're your own worst enemy. Okay. Um, and I really appreciate you guys. So have a great week and I'll see you next week. You're going to be great. I promise.